questions and answers, you can direct it at any other eminent speakers here, uh, and they will do their best. Uh, because in a 15 minute uh, presentation, it may be very difficult to do justice to some of these topics. So that is why there is a QA, and I'm sure you must be having various clarifications to see. Go ahead, please. Can you pass the mic to you, just uh, raise your hand, yes. Sir, good afternoon, sir. I'm Lieutenant Shivan Gurdwana from the first Indian Radio Mansion. And my uh, question is to uh, Officer Gurdwana. Uh, when uh, discussing the enduring challenges uh, posed by uh, Sri Lanka, uh, one of the obvious challenges we face, sir, is uh, the, the disinformation campaign carried out by the International Network of Delhi. And it is my understanding that we are of the opinion that Sri Lanka has failed in effectively uh, countering this uh, disinformation campaign in Tamil Nadu and the Western world. So uh, I would like to know your opinion in how best we could uh, counter this uh, challenge. Sri Lanka did brilliantly well in dismantling the LTT and as you can see there was no resurgence because of the security planning and implementation was operationally very effective. But internationally the government itself faced many challenges because the focus was in Sri Lanka. Government wanted to, to stabilize the environment within Sri Lanka. So overseas there wasn't so much of focus. The focus should have been ideally by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or the, uh, the, the Ministry of External Affairs. But we didn't have the same capability and the capacity in our foreign service as we had in our military and in our security establishment. So I believe that this is an enduring challenge for Sri Lanka. This means that we will have to perhaps train our diplomats better. Every diplomat should be able to face television, should be able to write a press release. I have shared with some Sri Lankan ambassadors that even if there is one paragraph against Sri Lanka, if the information is not true, you should write a response immediately. But I think that we have we haven't had that practice. It requires a lot of new thinking. As we look at the horizon, I see that the LTT infrastructure that existed overseas that supported terrorism in Sri Lanka, that is the Medivan faction which is based in Oslo in Norway. Then the TGT, the Transnational Government of Tamilina, which is based in New York, and Father S.J. Emanuel's network which is based out of UK. These three networks are the three main networks that are currently putting pressure on various governments overseas to mount pressure on Sri Lanka. But I believe that even those governments today have realized that a lot of what these networks are publicizing is misinformation and disinformation. But I believe that government itself should invest more in planning and preparing a very robust strategic communications capability. And this is a capability that Sri Lanka will need to build in the coming years. So, so it means the Ministry of External Affairs working very closely with the Ministry of Information, with Defense, with so many other agencies. And I think that we need also to train some of our diplomats to work in India, in South India particularly, more effectively. But these are very difficult challenges. These are capabilities that cannot be built in a short term. But I hope that the same way terrorism could be defeated in Sri Lanka, that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, External Affairs will take on this challenge, at least in this late stage, and create the essential capabilities within the ministry, such as a diaspora engagement unit in the ministry such as uh, uh, dealing with NGOs, because the NGOs are today being used by extremists and terrorist groups, 
such as another unit that will just deal with UN and its agencies to give the correct picture of what happened in the ground. So these require building new innovative capabilities to reach out and to counter that misinformation and disinformation. That is why I think a distorted picture has been given of some of the developments in Sri Lanka and this picture still has to be corrected. But with Sri Lanka inviting people to come here, I think a lot of this disinformation has been countered. Many Sri Lankan Tamils are now traveling back to Sri Lanka and when they see Jaffna, when they see what is happening in the northern areas, they believe that they have been bombarded with misinformation and disinformation and they had that dark perception of Sri Lanka because they were victims of the ATT dis disinformation campaign. Thank you. Next, please. Be precise and short so that there can be more questions. Excellent presentations. I am Dean Low, uh, the speaker here. Actually, uh, my question is connected to the first question also. Now, we have seen uh, in other countries, now for example, Channel 4, they basically came up with uh, four video footage. Last one was uh, killing of Prabhakaran's son. Next may be killing of Prabhakaran's daughter. So likewise, their propaganda is very fast. But except Mahinda Adhusinga, in Jaffna, he has created a beautiful video. That is where are sending story. But we have to actually take this to the other countries. Uh, Mr. Lalit Virdunga, you can remember we were in London three days in the London Marlboro House. How we try to impress the Sri Lanka image to creating lot of videos are there prepared by Ministry of Defense. So I clearly uh, take these videos to other countries and send stories like sending story how Sri Lanka Army helped and also this is a video clip. We can prepare certain video clips because it's a, uh, you know, United Nations Numerate Council sessions are coming very soon. So we have the capabilities, but my argument, communication, and basically there is no network in most of the countries with our system. Thank you. Yes. Your name, your name, please. Uh, my name is Tali Mavarganam, um, and I'm a, a lawyer based in Britain. In fact, um, I'm of Sri Lankan heritage. My proposal is one way of countering these concerns that have been raised would be to have a Sri Lanka centre in London where the holistic reality on the ground in Sri Lanka is translated to a centre where there are many diaspora groups and where the youth of um, these diaspora migrants will actually see the reality of the picture in Sri Lanka rather than being influenced by the Western media. Because actually it is the Western media that has been toxic in the radicalisation and alienation of which you rightly hear in Sri Lanka. Professor Gurunath, would you like to, because it's connected to this whole issue of dissemination of information, maybe we have a brief uh, response to Barrister Tanu Maivaganam is a very strong advocate that Sri Lanka creates a Sri Lankan centre in London to portray the actual ground reality of what happened in Sri Lanka and also the immense development today taking place in the country, especially in the Northeast. And I hope that uh, her suggestion, her state first call for a Sri Lanka centre in London uh, will be considered by our leaders and I hope that Mr. Lalit Virutunga himself will consider her suggestion. Uh, my question is also like related to the first questions and series of questions asked. Uh, this goes back to one of the studies that I have done previously. 
uh, on the aggravating youth revulsion due to ethnocentric uh, media and communication uh, used by internet and other electronic modes. And uh, in that study that was done during the war time, uh, during uh, 2002, 2003 and 2004, at that time uh, I have done the collection of data and I have understood that 68.5% of most of the youth from Northern East have traveled abroad. And they have now, if you look at their ages, most of them have grown there and they have come up to some standard by getting some sort of environmental uh, upbringing of those environments and gathered a good network. So if you look at their ideologies, mostly they are coming from ethnocentric backgrounds where they have some sort of, uh, some sort of a revenge against the Sri Lankan peace. So therefore I think it is vital that we have some sort of a network as all of you said, mentioned regarding like communicating peace to others, building up peace media, not ethnocentric media, but peace media in the domestic arena as well as in the international context. So this is just a comment that I wanted to give you and I support the uh, comments brought up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Maybe we take another perspective because we are now talking about dissemination of information. I think we fairly well driven home, the point that the government of Sri Lanka needs to have a very specific and a robust, as Professor Gurunath said, campaign to counter whatever that is happening outside. Any, yes? So my name is Major Ravalgala. My question is directed towards the senior colonel from China. The new, new streets of Pearl strategy and the new Silk Cruise strategy was evolved with the expansion of the Chinese economy and Sri Lanka played a dominant role in both these things. My question is, with the gas pipelines that have been laid Tajikistan, Afghanistan, India, Pakistan, and the pipeline that China is financing from Rangoon to, uh, uh, from Burma to China, if the energy source of China has been increased, do you think the import to Sri Lanka in this Asian uh, uh, shipping line would drop or would it remain the same? Uh, okay. Uh, actually, it's a question. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, when you talk about stream of her strategy of China, I don't know where it is the strategy formulated. <laughs> uh, I don't think China has got a such kind of strategy. But actually, China has been taking more and more increasingly more attention to the India Ocean region because. Uh, our economy is out, outward oriented. So the majority, actually, our, from my personal understanding, uh, our dependence, the economic dependence on exports is around uh, 60%. So maritime routes for trade is very important and also around 70% uh, of our trade goes through Indian Ocean. And around more, uh, nearly 80% uh, of our oil import, especially from Middle East and from Africa, 80% are passing, uh, passing us through the Indian Ocean. So that shows the kind of importance of, uh, of sea lanes of communication for China. Uh, and also, you've just mentioned that uh, actually China nowadays is trying to diversify its route of oil imports and oil and gas imports. Uh, actually, maybe uh, it's a kind of strategy to, to, to reduce the risk in over reliance on the Indian Ocean. But actually, this cannot uh, fundamentally solve the problem of China's dependence on, on the Indian Ocean. But actually, uh, you mentioned about the pipeline in Myanmar. 
actually Myanmar is still a kind of part of Indian Ocean. That does not mean that uh, if the pipe, actually the pipeline has already been completed. Uh, the pipe, uh, this does not mean that uh, the completion of the, of the pipeline in Myanmar will reduce China's dependency on the Indian Ocean, especially on Sri Lanka. Uh, 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 all in all, uh, the Indian Ocean will continue to play a very important role in China's economic, future economic development. Actually, you just uh, made, uh, just uh, uh, maybe I de uh, deviated a little bit, uh, a little bit. Actually, you mentioned about the stream of, of her strategy of China. Uh, so far as I know, China don't have such kind of strategy, and also China will not formulate or uh, formulate such kind of strategy because you know we have learned quite a lot from the experiences of the U USA. You know, being a superpower sometimes is burdensome. You know, China will not seek to become a world player. But China will try to seek international cooperation, especially uh, with uh, the countries in the Indian Ocean as witnessed in the past years. We have maintained very good relationship both with uh, Sri Lanka, uh, with India, and some efforts have been made by, by, by the two governments, and also with some Arabian countries, so that to assure the safety of the uh, like a few lanes of communication, and also China is dispatching. Uh, in the past years, we have been dispatching escort uh, 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 cruisers to the Indian Ocean, so that to to to, to, uh, to counter in the efforts to uh, counter piracy. Actually, uh, during the escort mission, uh, China is closely cooperating with related parties. Uh, including the USA and uh, NATO countries, and also some countries in the Indian Ocean. And so, actually, from my personal point of view, uh, it is it is not smart for China to formulate a kind of strategy of uh, stream. Actually, so uh, that is my answer to the question. Thank you. Just two more questions, short ones. Yes.
organizations in the administrative system sometimes uh, do not have the required capacity. So here the military being used not as a military force, but as to support or to fill those vacuums created in those organizations to fulfill the needs of the people sometimes. So now let's see for example. So military is being used as a trendsetter. Now the discipline of the country is gone down and once you go to an extreme of discipline, the people get into fighting like this. So in order to discipline the society, we need to uh, create some positive thinking and inculcate leadership qualities of the younger in the younger generation. That is how we have taken this university student education thing. That it set, set a new trend to the uh, country. So when the academic uh, people, the younger generation take the leadership, then they have the positive thinking. Because during the war, a lot of in, uh, in, uh, uh, the negative thinking breaking into a, your system. So you have to get it out. Now, input, a lot of inputs in the positive thinking. So that is one area. Then uh, the other thing that uh, the, uh, uh, the urban development, we create new trends here. That, uh, by example, soldiers. So we we'll create a, now Kalambu city, one of the most beautiful cities in the country. This has gone down to the entire country. People keep their houses clean now, organization clean, the places clean. We meet a lot of uh, uh, outside uh, provincial level politicians. They all talk about cleaning up their places and putting their places in order. So it has trend, set a new trend to the world. So here the military involvements in that place, yeah, it is not like the western. Here we are a reflection of the nation. Security forces a real reflection of the nation. So we have to get involved. Like not like in the western world. So they have their military forces to protect their force outside. Here it is not. And we are within the you know, this is our culture. This is our way of life. Therefore it, we have to uh, by means of all those uh, uh, communication strategies, we have to tell the world, here it is, we are doing a job which is required because when the other, other organizations do not have the capacity capability, military is structured, organized, uh, trained, and equipped to fill those vacuums. Yeah. That is how the military gets involved. Maybe I'll just add a very simple point uh, why the military is being asked to do things in circumstances where civilians would have been asked otherwise. Well, when the Nehru Pakuna, the Mahindra Raj Paksi International Performing Arts Theatre, was gifted to Sri Lanka, and it involved a lot of technical areas for management and to keep, keep it as an international menu, His Excellency immediately decided that it be handed over to the military for management. I can't think of a better solution. And the military up to now has managed it extremely well. There were, of course, uh, obstacles. There were various uh, points of view, say that how can someone in the military look at the softer side of life, arts. But these very people who criticized came on stage and said, well, we have never had so better, better treatment elsewhere. So I think it speaks a lot of the ability of the armed forces to be so flexible. Once again, I must commend uh, my dear friend, Gotabe, for inculcating that kind of mindset into the army. It take on urban development, take on other civilian issues. Okay, one more question, and then I'll just sum up very quickly.
Now, that is part and parcel of human nature. <laughs> so we need to know those things. We don't discard. Some people, the Westerners judge uh, Sri Lanka by their standards. So you don't have to fight with them. Only thing we have to market our point of view and say, this is how our system is structured, this is how we work, this is our culture, this is how we work. We don't uh, get the military. Those Western countries who study their militaries, they are basically uh, away from the society. When they come to the so, uh, society, the military, uh, it is kind of an alien element in the place. Uh, Here it is no, we, we are part and parcel of our society, appearing up it. So we, uh, we, uh, we are, therefore, uh, these criticisms uh, is always part and parcel of uh, when you go in the uh, 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 era, new era, the, all these experiences are new to the Sri Lankans as well. A lot of people who can't understand. Most of our people who opinion makers are Western educated, right? So they are convinced with those things and they come and try to uh, put those things uh, uh, here, uh, compare those things with the Western standards. Here it is not so. If you go to the North and East and the, the soldier, uh, one uh, uh, example I give you, the Sri Lankan soldier is the most respected uh, individual in the society today. The armed forces are the same. So if you get another country that you're fighting for a protected country, it is totally other way around. They are the most hated. Here it is other way around. So the, whether it is Sinhalese, Muslim or Tamil or any other community in Sri Lanka, the most respected people are very confident with the military. So the, all these are not what we say. It is uh, by the international organization also have identified that. So what we are doing, uh, what we should do at this moment to overcome the problems, uh, and uh, other people are criticizing, you can't prevent it, but only thing we have to have our uh, point of view being properly marketed as we discussed initially. Ladies and gentlemen, I think it's now time for us to close. I'll just take maybe a few minutes just to sum up very quickly. Uh, well, before I thank, I must also say uh, it's like sitting an exam. I have to collect all this information, just say it in five minutes, I mean, that's the kind of exams we have, right? Professor Gonorantha said, let us reform our education system. I think this is what we need to be doing. Well, uh, we had six eminent speakers. I, I can't uh, think of a better set of people to talk about these things. And, and to say so much in such a short time is also very difficult. But I think they brought out the essentials of uh, what we are talking about today. How Sri Lanka could become a hub in Asia, and what are those perspectives we need to be talking about? Professor Gunaratna, uh, in his usual very uh, articulated style, said, here is a restorative justice model rather than punitive. What country has done this earlier? To free 12,000 ex-combatants, rehabilitate them, well, the Commissioner General, rehabilitation of former, very easier. Uh, but also he propounded a very important theory which I hope the new education proposals will take into account. Don't create mono-ethnic schools. This is pretty important. Uh, I went to a school where there were all sorts of communities. Never had the feeling that, uh, well, I belong to a certain community or and the others to another. This is important so that we build the identity. Uh, the whole effort of these ladies and gentlemen who have led their lives, uh, sacrifice life and limb, is to build one Sri Lankan nation, a United Sri Lankan nation, I think that's pretty important. I also take uh, an important uh, point that he made. We physically eliminated terrorism, but I think uh, it's important that we do it psychologically as well. Take it outside. The fight is outside, not here. We have seen it. Uh, so we need to be setting up a strategic communications unit as a super position. Uh, and I think some of those interventions that were made makes it very clear that the government has to take this very, very seriously. Coming on to our friend from China, uh, Colonel Bo, he uh, looked at it from another perspective. Uh, he said, oceans have proved to be critical. So here we are. Uh, I remember when His Excellency uh, met the late President Hugo Chavez, um, President Chavez was holding the world map the other way. Like the whole world was hanging from Sri Lanka. I said, look, my friend, you come from a country where the pivot is Sri Lanka. So, so it's, uh, uh, I think it uh, tells us how important uh, 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 
strategic location needs and how important the ocean needs. Well, uh, also I think talked about uh, Sri Lanka benefits from its location for investment. Uh, another important point that Sri Lanka can ride on the emerging economic situation in East Asia and of course South Asia, mustn't forget India. Uh, no one will have doubts about its strategic measures. Very interestingly, in his uh, human session when he said, well, you know, China is not trying to be the policeman of the world. No, are we? So why should we? Why, why should people worry about Sri Lanka becoming a uh, strategic hub? We are not trying to police anyone. We are just trying to emerge as a country uh, to its fullest potential. Uh, mentioned about Sino-Sri Lanka relationship. Uh, thank you so much for uh, you. I think any Chinese speaker will always talk about how Sri Lanka, uh, in a very small way, China rallied some fact in the 50s, and that uh, bilateral relations at the highest level. Getting on to Major Rija from India, uh, obviously I didn't know that he had been here before uh, with the IBKF. Uh, that gives him a, a, a great advantage uh, of knowing what Sri Lanka is all about, what Sri Lanka has gone through, uh, the theatre of conflict, all that is very well known to him. So uh, in his second visit, he is able to bring all these things onto the table to tell us um, our strategic uh, location, how important it is in the Indian Ocean. Brought about four main issues. Strategic importance of Sri Lanka in the Indian Ocean, that location is unique. The security perspective, opportunity to emerge as a hub, and defense cooperation. These are uh, some of the things uh, he mentioned, the four main issues. And he also said, our opportunities always the challenges. This is important. If you don't make use of this, then here again we will be lagging behind. Here is an opportunity where we can forget about our challenges because we have that advantage. Well, uh, coming on to the High Commissioner of Pakistan in Sri Lanka, uh, credit to him, short notice, but I think what you presented the excellency was something to think about. Uh, obviously, your academic background helped you to do this in 24 hours. Uh, they talked about two important things, interstate security, intrastate security. Something that uh, he highlighted, there is potential for full spectrum warfare, a very frightful thought to me, but uh, you gentlemen, of course, uh, you feel very comfortable. Uh, you do, you're not bothered about war, but as a civilian, I feel very frightful, and I see many who uh, are in the audience. Uh, because in South Asia, we have this nuclear capability as well. Um, but also brought out the vital aspect of water. Fortunately, I think Diana talked about it. Uh, they are an island, uh, not connected to a mainland, so our water is our issue. But there are countries where water is an issue. If someone else has the source, and here uh, another country is a user. So this might also be a future uh, security aspect. And that Sri Lanka, Pakistan, defense cooperation has always been at a high level. Uh, Non-state actors often make the situation complex. How true? We have seen that, and that's what uh, probably Professor Kundrasna also referred to. Many non-state actors who want to make this whole thing a uh, money, money thing, uh, getting to this whole uh, situation and make it very complex. Uh, recommendations to make South Asia more stable and peaceful. Obviously, we need to do that. Uh, Sri Lanka, uh, the South Asia as a region must remain a non-aligned area. I think that's why uh, most of the uh, South Asian countries were, uh, were also originally members of the non aligned movement. Uh, our own commander of the army brought out another very interesting perspective. Uh, he used this model of Maslow's hierarchy of needs uh, and that people are worried about security. First, that you need to have. And I think that's why his excellency also said development without peace and peace without development. There is no way. So you need to ensure that you have peace for us to go ahead. Uh, he also referred to the fact that whoever who controls the Indian Ocean controls the world. And that uh, many invasions from the South Indians and of course later from the Western nations. Uh, and Britain obviously had the advantage. And uh, we have been colonized for years, over nearly 450 odd years. Uh, the Dutch came, uh, the Portuguese came in 1505, the Dutch and then the English. 
which has seen huge implications the way we live, the way we thought, the way we educated our young, the way we looked after our age, the way we cultivated, what we ate, what we dress now, all these things have been influenced. So I think it is important that we understand uh, how we start and what influenced us. These are extremely important in a, a situation where we are looking now to become the wonder of Asia. Uh, another very interesting thought that you uh, brought out. We are talking about opening our windows. Very good. If you open the window, you get sunlight, but mosquitoes will also come. So he said, you open the window, both at the bag, both will come. So, looking after the bag, making sure that they are not going to harm Sri Lanka, is a military job, obviously. So, security concerns, whatever conditions we are in, however developed we are, or we are on the path to development, security cannot be forgotten, and that is a very important uh, aspect of uh, what uh, mm, we are all about. Quoted Kofi Annan, who said, there can be a resurgence of a market once it has been subdued. But I think uh, the way we go about it, the way we have uh, strengthened our apparatus, we have uh, looked up from intelligence, and I know the intense work that the Secretary has done in bringing together the intelligence arms of the government, of the security forces, to be vigilant as to what is happening uh, anywhere in this country, so that we will not have this recurrence of uh, the uh, terrorism that we have uh, seen in the past. <laughs> the last, again, our own commander, Vice Admiral Jainat Kolabi, commander of the Navy, talked about, uh, of course, he has to talk about the Naval Hub. That's his red subject. But interestingly, he brought these 13 enablers of becoming a maritime power. Very interesting. I think uh, that can also be a very interesting study for the KDU. How can these enablers become real? Uh, in life. So you have an enabler, find, say, continuous navigable channel. How will we use it? What advantage does it accrue to our country? Uh, shipbuilding capability, how do we take it forward? Uh, merchant trade, he quoted, said, Mongolia doesn't have even a port, but with so many merchant vessels, uh, there's a lot. Sri Lanka is all about sea. Uh, so we need to be looking at it. But I think uh, the important point is that here is a situation, here is a uh, fantastic given situation of a visionary outlook. A leader having a vision, a leader uh, articulating his vision, making sure that what he said is being given effect to. I think that is uh, where uh, all this is. So I think uh, all in all these six speakers brought about uh, fantastic aspects of Sri Lanka becoming a hub and of course moving towards wonder of Asia. The question and answers also I must add and thank you for those who posed those questions and thank you for those uh, who responded. Uh, obviously without in-depth knowledge you cannot respond the way you responded. So once again, I'm uh, voice. Thank you so much for uh, laying before this audience which is eager to know, hungry for knowledge, uh, trying to understand the different perspectives. Uh, it was great uh, chatting this session. Uh, thank you, KDU. Thank you, uh, the Commandant, for uh, rather the Vice Chancellor, uh, for inviting me to do this. But I must say, um, to me, it felt like I'm sitting the advanced level once again. That's the most dreaded example in this country. Thank you.